STARMUS is a global science festival bringing together some of the brightest minds in the scientific community to inspire the next generation of explorers. The next STARMUS festival will take place in Yerevan in September 2022. Today I'm joined by Garik Israelian, an astrophysicist and scientist, to discuss this and more. So Mr. Israelian, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for inviting. So Garik, you are the founder of the STARMUS festival, which has had some big names uh, give its backing to it, including Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, Brian May, also Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong have been featured. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the festival and what the people of Yerevan should expect in September? Yeah, well, actually, I'm a co-founder. <laughs> so I always say the festival was founded by me and Brian May. So the idea of Starmus actually emerged from our many, 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 many discussions about science, astronomy and music and arts. And so we have to bring together those uh, disciplines and, and, and why it is important, what we have to do, so those things. And so we met in 98 with Brian May and we became friends, very close friends. And then and now I helped him to finish his PhD in astrophysics. I was kind of his supervisor or a supervisor, whatever you call it. But, uh, uh, but because Brian is a scientist, I would say he's very passionate about science and astronomy, especially astronomy, right? And so, of course, people know him as a musician, uh, as a Queen, legendary guitarist, right? And the founder of Queen. But Brian is, is an intellectual, he's a, he's a very, very intelligent person. And, and he's also a scientist, he understands perfectly what's happening in science. And um, so for me, it was an honor to meet a person like <laughs> someone like him and get inspired by his personality, not only a music part, but also as a person, so extremely honest and very, very active. And, and so during years and years, we, we gradually arrived to this idea of creating a festival, an event which is very ambitious, Oh, his goal is to bring science to to the public, to people, but uh, but um, use a power of arts and music to make science very cool, or to to make the event very entertaining, interesting, and so on, and also bring together these big communities of artists and scientists because we think that uh, and especially we have a proof of that from the Apollo area. From, from moon landing action in Lots of musicians have been inspired by moon landing. We know that for the fact that so many songs have been written, that the David Bowie and uh, Pink Floyd, so there's a generation of artists, and not only musicians, also painters and filmmakers. So there's a generation of artists super inspired by Apollo, actually space race, right? From Gagarin to moonwalkers and so on. And now we thought, okay, so the science is again very cool. Now we have AI, we have very interesting things happening, maybe we're going to Mars very soon, and so on. So those things, and we need again this push, we need an event and help artists again to be inspired by science and also help to, to bring science to people using the power of musicians, very popular musicians, those who value science, those who appreciate science, and those who are happy to do something to support science. So we actually, with Brian, we started, okay, so we put together an event, so we invited these guys and we do this, we do that, and so this will be the format. And so this is how the Starmus was born. So the first festival we did in 2011, and we were really Really lucky to have Neil Armstrong as a as a as a as a keynote speaker and someone who opened the festival and so that was a really breakthrough for for us because everyone knows that Armstrong was a very private person, very modest. You would never go to conferences. You would never hear him giving lectures and talks. So people were asking, how did you manage to bring Neil Armstrong to your festival? This is the first one. No one ever heard of. Him. And it turned out that Neil himself, he, he appreciated the fact that the festival was created by a scientist, an artist. And he, by the way, said, I like the fact that you are not supported by multinationals, 
cola and big companies and or the politicians. <laughs> and so I saw that there's, there's a bunch of scientists and, and, and artists behind you, your event and, and the goal. And I, I like the format is amazing and science and so on. And so I decided, OK, I'm going to go to this. <laughs> That's very good. And, and my next question is rather simple. Why Armenia? Why was Armenia chosen as the destination for the next conference? Yeah, yeah. So that, that was in, in Zurich. The last festival in uh, 2019 it was a tribute to Apollo, Apollo 11. And we had seven Apollo astronauts on stage. It was a mind-blowing festival, <laughs> very good. So I invited the president of Armenia, Armen Sarkisian, to, to come to Starmus and, and perhaps give a, an introduction, a short speech. Uh, not as a part of a program, not in a science program, but just as an opening uh, as part of the opening ceremony, right? To speak five minutes. And so he came and he was amazed. He was shocked by the festival. He saw what we have done, the Stephen Hawking Medal Ceremony and all those things. So he was like, wow, well, you should come to Armenia. And then he invited basically everyone to visit Armenia and to come to Armenia. And, 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 and he said, okay, you should come to Armenia. We should talk to the government. I meet the Prime Minister and the Minister of Science Education and then probably they will support. And I came and I had a meeting with them, with the government, and, and they were like with both hands saying, wow, we want this festival in Armenia. We need a festival to support science, to inspire students and, and the generation. So we said, well, yeah, please, please do it. And so and we decided and, 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 and I, uh, I had to convince our advisory board that uh, Armenia is the place to go because we had several invitations from other countries. Mm. And, uh, and uh, in, a, in a different situation, Armenia was going to compete with those countries, but because I was there, <laughs> so basically the, it, it was very easy to convince the board saying that this is a country that with long traditions in science and that it's, uh, we are needed very much in a country like Armenia. So that was my point, because I realized that we are not that needed in a country like Switzerland or Norway. So those countries already support science and the, so everything is fine in those countries, but not in Armenia. We, they need a science festival. So we will manage, to, we can inspire lots of kids and, and, and students and, and public. So, and actually that was my point to our advisory board and saying, we are needed actually in Armenia, guys, so let's go there. And they understood, they, they got the point and they said, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, kind of alluding to that, one thing I find interesting is when you look at some of the Soviet era murals in Armenia, you mm. see depictions of astronauts and cosmonauts, yeah. and it's almost like looking back in time at a sort of future vision. Yeah. Um, what do you think about Armenia's ability now, however, to contribute to, to science globally? And also, uh, there is a uh, talk, especially after the 2020 war of Armenia, focusing more on research and development on science. I'm wondering what you think about all of that. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, it's a very difficult situation. You know, Armenia is, uh, you, you place another country, one of the African countries you place in a situation like this is different. Yeah. You place Armenia with its population and mentality and with so many amazing <laughs> young people and so on. But you place this country in a situation like that. We know with all the political problems we have. So it's very difficult, very hard, because the need to, to study, to do science and to do business and to improve the country is, is there. If you let, I always say that if you let Armenia to decide its future, even without much gas and oil, and we don't need that, right? Simply by, uh, by this passion of doing something, creating something which is in, in, in the genes, in, it's, it's in army. So that would be enough to, to push the country up to, to go ahead and so on. So uh, unfortunately, we have what we have with our neighbors in geopolitics, right? This is the truth. Uh, and it's really sad, yeah? But I always, uh, I also understand that maybe those difficulties also help to struggle and become even stronger. 
So that's also this component. So this maybe at some point that's not that's maybe we're going to have you know to to become even stronger because you you become stronger when you lose, not when you win. That's the evolution. So the winner always will lose at some point or go down. <laughs> so that was kind of a normal. So you you think that you are a winner, and then at the end you lose, right? So we lost, we are in a hard situation, a difficult situation, but maybe the evolution will change things and will go up. And now the decision to, to push science and help education is really good. I, I welcome this decision of the government and to, to invest more in science, mm -hmm. to make more investments, to welcome science, to push science and technology and education. This is what we have to do. I think they have to understand that the balance is you have a limited amount of money. It's not a rich country, so you have to manage the funds, the budget. And, uh, and in this situation, increasing uh, uh, a budget of science and pushing your cash is really a clever, very clever step. You should, of course, we have to find mechanisms to make it very efficient, blah, 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 but that's the next thing. But the line, the, the philosophy that this is what we have to do is very good. And you're a professor at the Laguna, La Laguna University, University in Spain. Yeah. At, uh, you are involved also at the uh, Institute of Astrophysics in Canary Islands. Yes. You've lectured in Brussels, Utrecht, in yeah. Sydney. But you are from Yerevan. You studied yeah. in Yerevan. Can you tell us a bit about that journey? And also, did the Soviet Union and its perspective on space and science kind of inspire you to become a future explorer back in those days? Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I grew up in Yerevan. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I studied at Yerevan State University. Uh, in my generation, we were very much uh, influenced by sci-fi and space. And so I remember when I was a kid, the cosmonauts were like, treated like heroes and they were always on TV and so on. But even it was not uh, so inspiring for me until I, I, I went to sci-fi. So I started reading sci-fi and that, that that took me to science. Actually, I went to science through sci-fi. Uh, I was not a good student at all. At the, at the, the primary school was a disaster. So I was not <laughs> one of the worst in the class. <laughs> <laughs> so the sci-fi books and sci-fi films, they, they helped me to discover uh, science, to discover physics. And I studied at Yerevan State University. Uh, we had a very, very good system of education. I would say the standards were very high in physics and maths and natural sciences. So then I had to do my PhD in Bureaucratic Observatory. And, um, and the Soviet Union collapsed. <laughs> so <laughs> but I have already a couple of papers published, very nice papers. Uh, and that helped me to, to, to get a postdoc position to go to Holland and then to to Belgium to start what we call a life of a postdoc, mm -hmm. which means moving from one place to another <laughs> with different contracts, doing research, publishing, blah blah blah, until you find a, a until you find a permanent position in academy, in university system, or in a research institute. So that's when I ended up in, in Canary Islands. And I was super happy because that's one of the best places people dream in astronomy mm -hmm. to do science and, and, and observations and it's in my field in, in, in observation and astrophysics. It's yeah. one of the top places and I was super lucky to, to get a permanent a position and a professorship and so on and stay and have my project and my lab and, and, and do my research in Canary Islands and it's, it's very cool. <laughs> and you've also been credited with leading a team which, which discovered some of the first in instances of, of evidence that supernova explosions result in the creation of black, black hole, holes, yeah. black hole masses. Uh, why is the realization, the, the acceptance that supernova explosions result in black holes being created such an exciting discovery in your opinion? Yeah, well, there are two types of black holes. They are called stellar mass black holes. So the, the black holes which have masses anything between 2 or 70, 80 solar mass. So it's a huge spectrum of masses. So we call them stellar mass black holes. 
and there are also supermassive black holes. So those guys are sitting in centers of galactic nuclei. Mm. So they have millions and millions of masses of, of the sun, solar mass. So m my topic was stellar mass black holes, mm -hmm. because we, we had an evidence that these black holes exist in our galaxy. We detected about 20 by, now we have more, 30, 40. It's, it's not easy to detect them, there are millions. But to detect those black holes, yes, yeah, so you need special techniques, etc. So I will not go to, to this, but, but uh, so by, so when the discovery was done in 2099, I think, so we have evidence for 20 black holes in our galaxy. And um, so what you know, what, what you observe actually is a single, not a single, is a black hole with a, with a normal star around. Mm. And, uh, but there's no evidence how they were born. So what was the mechanism, how you, how you form a black hole? So there were two competing theories. One was saying that, well, you have a massive star and it explodes and the rest will collapse and form a black hole. And the second theory was saying, you don't need any explosion. And the star is very massive, will lose energy and so on, and it will directly collapse without explosion and form a black hole. And so when the star explodes, we call it supernovae. And we see a lot of supernovae stars in, in different galaxies. It's not a very common thing, supernovae explosions. So, so far we have detected in our galaxy just a few, just a few supernovae. But then, so how do you know? if the black holes are formed after these explosions mm -hmm. or they go to direct collapse, collapse, you know. And, uh, and so my job was to uh, demonstrate that in those systems where we have a black hole, I found an evidence of a supernova explosion. So I actually discovered that there was a supernova explosion and now we have a seven solar mass black hole sitting in the system. So that's, uh, that was a very clear evidence that was actually first evidence that supernovae can produce black holes. So the competing theory which was saying that you don't need a supernova, you can form it directly with a collapse and so on, and supernova would only produce neutron stars, mm -hmm. which is a small mass black hole, but still it's a star which can emit energy and photons, what's called a neutron star. The mass is one solar mass, 1.5. And, uh, but this discovery that was, clearly demonstrated that the, the supernova can produce black holes. Mm. So what was, was the whole thing? <laughs> Maybe not so interesting, but no, anyway. it's remarkable. Uh, <laughs> it's truly <laughs> remarkable. And, and we recently we saw the first actual image of a black hole. Yes. We uh, saw the, yeah. the James Webb telescope lift yeah. off. Uh, yeah. Also, there is talk, as you mentioned, of a manned mission to Mars one day. So it's actually quite an exciting period for scientific discovery. Very and exciting. Yeah, I was wondering what you think about that and also how the Starmus Festival might fit into all that. Yeah, I think James Webb is going to make a, a really breakthrough in, in, in the physical of black holes. Mm. First of all, in physics of uh, supermassive black holes, the ones that sit in the centers of different galaxies, right? Mm. So because of the precision and, uh, and the image quality and, and... It will bring an image of a black hole possibly? Not an image of a black hole, but the centers of galactic nuclei, where you have uh, lots, of, uh, uh, lots of single stars moving around black holes. So this, is, this was a Nobel Prize was awarded to, to cancel to Roger Penrose and a colleague from UCLA for discovering how stars move around supermassive black holes, change their orbits. And from movement of those stars, you can estimate the mass of a black hole, because you don't see a black hole. You see those stars moving around, and if you track them, if you see their orbits, you can estimate and calculate the mass of the, that have millions of solar masses, the so supermassive black holes. So, so this, this team, is, they got the Nobel Prize actually two years ago. Because you can't actually see a black hole. No, you don't see. The, the, the discovery when they saw the, the, the black hole, it was just the light that was uh, the reflected, the, the light that was going a lensing effect of a black hole. But the, the light, which there's no light emission from a black hole. Well, there is a radiation emitter, which is a Hawking radiation, 
but it's a different story. You can't really detect the Hawking radiation because it's so tiny and so, so um, weak. Mm. There's no way that we can detect this Hawking radiation. It's only responsible for, uh, for a death of a black hole. So it's the only channel that the, the black holes will lose the mass mm. and energy. It's going to take trillions of billions of billions of years. So if you have an isolated black hole in, in, in intergalactic medium or interstellar medium, and you'll just let it go, and it, it's going to take so long. It's longer than the time of the universe <laughs> for, for this black hole to, to disappear through the Hawking radiation. And uh, yeah, and about Starmus, uh, so was the uh, uh, Starmus Armenia. The Starmus Armenia is, um, we already announced uh, 30 speakers, several Nobel laureates, and uh, first Armenian astronaut, Jim Bagian. Uh, and I think it's his first visit to Armenia. It's, and um, then very soon we'll announce musicians, big artists, and I don't want to give any names because that will be for the press conference that we will organize soon. But we do expect um, superstars of uh, science communications, of science, all coming to Armenia. Very, very interesting event. Uh, I think it's, it's a regional, it's a first regional science festival. Mm -hmm. There was nothing like this in Georgia or Turkey or, uh, or even in, in peninsula, in Arabic countries. So no one has ever seen a science festival. So it will be the first science festival in this, uh, in this region. And uh, yeah, amazing program. <laughs> I don't want to give many details that we have. But we will do a Starmus camp, it's a science camp, with lots of workshops on robotics and AI and nuclear energy, green energy, uh, seismology, lots of many different topics. It's open for public that people can come and learn about science, learn about science during the week. And some concerts and, uh, and experimental music, lots of musicians who want to do something related to science with special effects, visuals, combining these and that, and so there's many <laughs> interesting, <laughs> yeah. Perfect, well, truly insightful. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, thank you. And the festival's name is Starmus. It will be coming to Yerevan in September, 2022. Thank you for joining us on CivilNet.